We are so excited, we just can't hide it. CBS Mornings are, well, everything your morning should be. Let's do it! Let's go! CBS Mornings, starting at 7. Democrats now have 51 seats in the U.S. Senate. There's no excuses in life, and I'm not going to make any excuses now because we put up one heck of a fight. We'll be continuing negotiations to chart a path forward to fully fund the government for the next year in an omnibus and our military in the NDAA. The former president's company convicted on 17 counts, including conspiracy, tax fraud, and falsifying business records. The jury verdict can be taken as a uh, indication that they thought he did know. So that has a lot of implications for going forward. Welcome to Red and Blue. I'm Scott McFarland in Washington on a very busy day. We thank you for joining us. And we begin tonight with a major victory for Democrats in Georgia. CBS News projects Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock will win in the state's high-stakes runoff election there. It means the 2022 midterms are finally over. And the makeup of next year's Congress is finally official. In that final contest last night, incumbent Democrat Warnock beat his Republican challenger Herschel Walker by several thousand votes. Democrats will now have 51 seats in the Senate come January. And lawmakers are now shifting their focus to a number of other priorities, including passing a bill to fund the government and the annual defense authorization bill. For more on this and more, Rebecca Kaplan and Nicole Killian join us now. Rebecca is CBS News Capitol Hill producer. And Nicole is my colleague, CBS News congressional correspondent, who's in Atlanta still for us covering that runoff election. Nicole, let's start in Atlanta. From all you saw over these past few days and from yesterday, what's your big takeaway from what happened yesterday and last night? Well, I think the big takeaway is the diversification of this state and how it has really made it a very competitive uh, battleground. You know, Georgia has typically been more of a red state, and uh, certainly uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, Republican support, for instance, in the general for someone like uh, Governor Brian Kemp. But then you look at what happened last night with uh, Senator Raphael Warnock winning by a significant margin over his Republican rival, Herschel Walker. And it really kind of shows you the extent to which uh, Georgia has become a swing state to a certain extent and how it has become uh, to some uh, the center now of uh, the political universe. So I think that is certainly one main takeaway uh, from the election. But uh, certainly we know that Senator Warnock uh, returned to Capitol Hill uh, earlier today, uh, looking a lot more relieved now that he's back in his day job, this time for a full term of six years. Even before Senator Warnock returned here, Senator Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, was having a bit of a victory parade. Let's listen to what Senator Schumer said just this morning. They say all good things come to those who wait, and this outcome is absolutely worth the wait. After one year, 10 months, and 17 days of the longest 50-50 Senate in history, 51, yeah. a slim majority. That is great, and we are so happy about it. Nicole, you, Rebecca, and I have been talking a lot about this, but let's explain, Nicole, the difference between a 51-49 Democratic majority and a 50-50. What does that mean in the months ahead? Well, I think there are small differences and big differences. You know, big picture, is this going to allow things to get done more easily or smoothly on Capitol Hill? Uh, probably not, but it does give Democrats just a bit more leverage when it comes to committees, uh, when it comes to judicial nominations, being able to get those through uh, more uh, quickly and easily. But as far as, uh, you know, big ticket legislation, uh, Democrats are still going to have to work across the aisle and make sure that they get the support of their Republican colleagues. You know, we always talked about that magic number 10, that Democrats uh, needed 10 Republicans in this currently uh, divided 50-50 Senate. Well, now uh, that margin will be just a hair smaller at nine, but that still means that they're going to have to uh, do a lot of uh, extending of the olive olive branch, uh, if you will, to get that Republican cooperation, which is something that Leader Schumer has already started talking about. 
That's the next Congress. Let's talk about the current Congress, Rebecca. 26 days left and an awful lot still to do. There was supposed to be this afternoon this debate potentially setting the table for votes on this military authorization bill, but that got held up. That's held up at the moment, uh, Scott. And one thing we're not exactly sure of is how this is going to resolve. But we should actually look back to the fact that it actually took quite a bit of effort just to get here to an agreement on the overall National Defense Authorization Act. One critical thing that conservatives had been pushing for, for was a removal of the vaccine mandate for the military. This is actually something that was opposed by the Biden administration and the top brass at the DOD, but ultimately clearly was something that Democrats on the Hill felt that they had to use as a negotiating tool to get enough. Republicans on the bill to move this forward. The other option would have been punting the NDIA to the next Congress when Republicans will control the House and would have a lot more control over policy and what that looked like in general. Uh, what we're waiting for at this hour, if we can get a little technical here for a minute, this bill was supposed to start moving through the machinery of passing the House, going to the Rules Committee, going to the floor for a procedural vote and then a final vote. And we're actually seeing it held up in the Rules Committee now. There's some discussions that there may be some asks from the Congressional Black Caucus trying to include some other legislative priorities. They are meeting at this hour, so we are waiting to see what comes out of that meeting and if it changes the outlook for the bill on the Hill going forward. But this is one of those year-end must-pass items that they really do have to get done. Late today, we were speaking with Senate Republicans, including Senator Rick Scott of Florida, Senator Mike Lee of Utah, who were celebrating the removal of that vaccine mandate from this military bill, calling it a victory, seemingly making it more palatable for Republicans. Mitch McConnell announced his support for it today. The holdup, Rebecca, seems to be right now, at least today, in the Democratic caucus in the House. That's where we're seeing it at the moment. And part of the reason it was so critical to get this Republican support on board was because of the fact that this isn't going to pass with Democratic votes alone, even though Democrats control the House and the Senate. There are always a number of Democrats who vote against the National Defense Authorization Act, principally from the progressive wing of the party, because they want to see more defense, sorry, more domestic spending and less defense spending. So that's always tough when it gets to a bill that is really all about defense spending. They want more domestic priorities. So you always are going to need a subset of Republicans to offer offset the loss of Democratic votes there. Uh, but now it, we are waiting to see if there's even going to be enough Democratic votes on board to get this through the House, because it's going to be a coalition of Democrats and Republicans. And even though, yes, Republicans and conservatives are happy about the end of the vaccine mandate being included in this bill, there are still a lot who are going to vote no anyway. Some wanted the vaccine mandate removal to go further. They wanted back pay for soldiers who were discharged because they refused to take the vaccine. So there are definitely going to be some Republicans who vote no no matter what some Democrats who vote no, no matter what. So it's all about threading that needle here. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. And I'll also note the senators who were celebrating the removal of the vaccine mandate were couching their, 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 their approval with some concerns that it didn't go far enough. Senator Mike Braun today said Republicans were clearly caught flat-footed and remain flat-footed when it comes to campaigning for the Senate. Nicole, what's your sense of what Raphael Warnock has planned now that he gets this job for six years and doesn't have to run another four times for it over the next six years? Well, you know, that will be contingent in part on Democrats' agenda, which Leader Schumer didn't necessarily want to get into today. But Senator Warnock has said that he wants to continue to work on a lot of the issues that he has to date, whether that is the issue of health care and getting the cap on those insulin prices or whether it is uh, dealing with the issue of manufacturing. Uh, you know, those are some of the issues that he wants to get a better handle on and to be able to do more, not only for the state, but also for the country. And he also said that he is really anxious to work across the aisle, uh, you know, that he is not here in the Senate uh, simply to, uh, you know, do Rep Democrats' uh, agenda strictly, and uh, that he wants to be able to partner uh, with his Republican colleagues as well. That is something he spent a lot of time on the trail talking about, uh, including working across the aisle with someone like, for instance, a Senator Ted Cruz. So he says he does want to do more of that type of work uh, going forward. And I think, you know, at this point, uh, he can kind of breathe a, a bit of a sigh of relief. He has talked about having to run uh, at least five different times now for this position, but now that the seat is secure for the the next uh, six years, uh, he can kind of take a little breather, although there is already talk now of whether there could be more in his political future, given uh, what he was able to pull off last night. Nicole Killian in Atlanta, Rebecca Kaplan in Washington, where it's raining in both cities. Uh, nice to see you both. Thank you both for your reporting.
The Supreme Court heard oral arguments Wednesday about whether to adopt a legal theory that could fundamentally change how elections are conducted. This theory could give state legislatures sole authority to set election rules, even if they result in partisan gerrymandering or weaken voter protections. Republican lawmakers from North Carolina are pushing the so-called independent state legislature theory, which says state laws should take priority over court decisions. The state's Democratic-led Supreme Court had rejected a voting map proposal earlier this year that heavily favored Republicans. Instead, the court produced its own map that gave seven seats to each party in the midterms. As we just heard, Congress still has a long to-do list, including making sure the military is funded. And now COVID vaccine requirements are among the negotiables. How one congressman, who's also a veteran, feels about that, coming up next, you're streaming Red and Blue. Original CBS Reports documentary. Yoga and wellness has become a place of anti-science. Online clickbait. The algorithms feed you content based upon your own fantasy. Potentially at my peril. There's no question about it. Spreading digital disinformation. Their entire yoga studio and spiritual community got so embedded in all of the QAnon stuff that it became a sick place. Why pro-health people are fertile ground for anti-science messages. We can just go into the whole mask thing. A lot of us just believe that symbolism for silencing people. People are locked in this mindset. They've been taught to accept what the medical doctors say. No longer are you going to be willing to take any medical advice. It's a big problem that we urgently need to address. An original CBS Reports documentary streaming now. An original CBS Reports documentary. We need to put an end to this territorial status. Will statehood create a better Puerto Rico? So that we have the same quality of life that you see in the States. What do you worry about? Me living here in the future. They're giving incentives to non-Puerto Ricans to come to Puerto Rico. And extract our natural resources and take over our land. Vacation in Puerto Rico, and in exchange for that, you don't pay taxes. Why would I allow somebody who abused me for 123 years to then consume me? An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. When weather turns extreme. States from the plains to the northeast are bracing for more than two feet of heavy snow. Every second counts. This is a monster winter storm. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real. There's a wrinkle in the forecast, the accumulating ice. You'll have time to get prepared. Take precautions before you head out. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. We are so excited. We just can't hide it. CBS mornings are, well, everything your morning should be. Let's do it! Let's go! CBS mornings, starting at 7. Stories that inform, inspire, and brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to Red and Blue. I'm Scott McFarland in Washington. As Congress looks to avoid a government shutdown in nine days, formally authorizing the military for 2023 is also still on the agenda. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell talked about the importance of the NDAA, otherwise known as the National Defense Authorization Act, earlier today on the Senate floor. This strong bipartisan NDAA is a huge step in that direction. The bill tees up a significant and badly needed increase in defense spending, $45 billion above President Biden's insufficient request, and roughly $75 billion over last year's level. 
Once again, Congress agreed on a bipartisan basis that President Biden's defense budget request was anemic and insufficient. For more, Massachusetts Democratic Congressman and former Marine officer Seth Moulton joins us now from Capitol Hill. He's also a member of the House Armed Services Committee. Mr. Moulton, it's an especially busy day, so we're especially grateful for your time. You just heard Senator McConnell call this new military bill a huge step in the right direction. From what you've seen, do you agree? And if so, what are the most important parts of the bill? I don't often agree with Mitch McConnell, but in this case, I do. It's not perfect. I have plenty of objections. There were important provisions, such as protecting our Afghan allies, uh, that I had included in the House version of the bill that were then stripped out of the Senate version. So it's not perfect. I don't love it, but it absolutely moves the ball forward, and it's the right thing to do for our troops, and that's why I look forward to voting for it later today. We had been anticipating some floor action on this bill this afternoon, but it hasn't happened. Do you know what the holdup or the delay is? I don't know specifically, but the general consensus is that they're having trouble getting the numbers together. Uh, of course, there are Republicans who will vote against it uh, because they don't like something in the bill. There are uh, Democrats on the progressive wing of our party that will vote against it as well. This is always the problem with the defense bill. It's up to people in the middle, Democrats and Republicans, to come together uh, to do the right thing for our troops. But it's often the isolationists on the right in the Republican Party and the progressives on the left who found, find some objection to the bill and, and therefore don't want to support it. They characterize this as a must-pass piece of legislation. What are the implications if it doesn't pass before the end of the Congress? Well, first of all, let's talk about what it means for our troops. This bill includes important provisions uh, to raise pay and benefits for our troops at a time when inflation uh, is a huge issue for all Americans. It modernizes our defense in important ways to meet the threat arising the Pacific of China. I was just in Taiwan two months ago, and the threat from China is real. And our military commanders want new resources to meet that challenge. If we don't pass this bill, they won't get them. And ultimately, that means that Americans may lose their, lose their lives fighting a war that we should be able to prevent with the right preparations. Obviously, the Defense Department has been doing a lot to support the war in Ukraine. I mean, it's kind of ironic when you hear people in Congress uh, being such strong supporters of the Ukrainians and then talk about voting against our own defense bill, because, of course, a lot of the resources that go to Ukraine especially when it comes to the personnel that train uh, the, the, the Ukrainian troops and advise them on the ground, uh, that's coming through this defense bill. So there's a lot of good in this bill, and that's why we've got to get it passed, despite the fact that every one of us can come up with an objection if we want. Part of this vaccine mandate appears to have been lifted, the mandate for active duty and reserve military members. What impact is that going to have? And it seems like that's an acceptable change to House Democrats? Well, I don't know that it's acceptable in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, because I think it sends a mixed message to our troops. Uh, we mandate all kinds of vaccines in the military that are scientifically proven. There's no reason why we shouldn't mandate the COVID vaccine, which is scientifically proven as well. It's just because of Republicans playing politics, playing QAnon conspiracy theory politics with COVID that they want this out of the defense bill. But this is one of those tough compromises that we have to be willing to make in order to get the bill over the finish line. My hope is that the Department of Defense will revise the vaccine mandate to make it clear that there's a set of vaccines that apply across the board to everyone in the military, not just the COVID vaccine, but plenty of other vaccines that have been required for a long time. And that should be clarified by the Secretary of Defense in the future. But if we need to take that mandate out in order to get it over the finish line, it's a great example of a change that I don't like, but I'm willing to live with in order to support our troops. The military was losing a number of service members to this mandate. That's right. And this is one of the reasons why it sends a horribly mixed message to our troops. A lot of military uh, members are a good number, not a huge percentage, but a good number of troops were kicked out because they failed to follow a lawful order to get this vaccine. So to now go back and say, oh, we didn't really mean it, that wasn't an order that's important enough for us to keep in, sends a decidedly mixed message to our troops. It's one of the reasons why I have a big problem with this provision. 
But this is an example of the kind of compromise that has to go on in D.C. in order to get these things done. We can bicker about this over Christmas and into the new year and not ultimately convince Republicans to come to the side of common sense and keep this provision in the law, or we can pass it today and get the troops and our commanders the resources that they need to continue to defend our country. In our final moments here, Congressman, have you been briefed by leadership or by your colleagues of where in the world they are and keeping the government funded and keeping the lights on December 16th? You know, there's probably as much speculation running around Capitol Hill as there is uh, all over America and, and at, at offices like yours who are trying to figure out what the, what the ultimate result will be. I've heard predictions all over the map. But I'll tell you this, if we don't come together and not just pass a continuing resolution to continue funding the government at current levels, but actually pass appropriations bill, come together on an omnibus to make new investments, make changes to our uh, investments that we need to meet the new challenges of the new year, then we're missing a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity to better support our troops, a huge opportunity to better support Americans. So let's come together, Democrats and Republicans, and actually do our job to pass an omnibus bill and not just settle for another continuing resolution. Congressman Seth Moulton, we're grateful for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Great to see you. Well, the elephant who wasn't in the room last night in Georgia was former President Donald Trump after he handpicked the Republican challenger, Herschel Walker. What Republicans on Capitol Hill are saying today about last night's defeat. That's next. You're streaming Red and Blue, reporting across the political divide. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. An original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression, Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. States from the plains to the northeast are bracing for more than two feet of heavy snow. Every second counts. This is a monster winter storm. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real. There's a wrinkle in the forecast, the accumulating ice. You'll have time to get prepared. Take precautions before you head out. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be? And brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Always send the people home happy. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. After decades in the public eye and public service, this mother-daughter duo is now talking about gutsy women. What's the gutsiest thing you've ever done? We go person to person with Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
In today's Money Watch, business analyst Jill Schlesinger is here to help. How do you even begin to make the best use of your money? If you've got a match from your employer, Ooh. don't give away that money. Dollar, dollar, Jill, y'all. CBS Mornings, starting at 7. Welcome back to Red and Blue. I'm Scott McFarland. Former President Trump handpicked Herschel Walker to run for that Georgia Senate seat back in 2021. And right away, there were questions about candidate quality. And it took Republican leader Mitch McConnell months to embrace Walker's candidacy. And then there was scandal after scandal after scandal. And now many are blaming the former president for pushing a flawed candidate in such a competitive swing state. Another example of Republican elected officials having to do the delicate dance of pushing back on Mr. Trump while not alienating his supporters. We don't undo anything. Uh, we're never for anything. Then when it comes to how do you change it, Trump was a manifestation of half the country fed up with that back in 16. Uh, we did a lot of things that worked. Uh, and if that's going to work going forward, you're going to have to talk about what worked, not what you're mad about. So I hate overgeneralizing and saying it was all because of this voice on it one way or the other. Um, there's just no way to ever tell because everybody has a different perspective on it. I don't think this, this was any referendum on, on President Trump. Uh, I think this is a referendum on us learning uh, the cycle of how to run an election. And we found that in several states. And uh, being a football coach, you, you lose a game, you learn from it. You win a game, you learn from it. And we as Republicans have to learn about getting people out to vote. Joining us now, CBS News political correspondent, Caitlin Huey Burns. So Caitlin, you did great work today speaking with so many Republicans. I'm having difficulty getting a sense of who the fall guy is here. Everybody says yeah. in, that there was, a, there was a defeat, but nobody seems to be ascribing blame to anyone. Yeah, Scott, that's exactly right. And you're not hearing Donald Trump being called out by name, although he's kind of hovering over all of this. What's interesting being up on the Hill and talking to these lawmakers and also talking to operatives in the states is that you're not hearing really any sugarcoating about what happened to Republicans this midterm year. There's not a lot of people saying, well, look, at least we won the House. Uh, they are acknowledging that there are problems within the party, especially with independent voters. That's what I heard over and over from Republicans today on Capitol Hill saying that the party has a problem with independent voters. But when asked, you know, what is the problem, they couldn't really articulate what that is. We heard a lot of them say, look, we need to have an agenda. We need to have something forward looking. We need to have something to offer voters instead of just running against someone. But when you ask about how Donald Trump plays into this, um, you kind of get some mixed results. There is a feeling, kind of broadly speaking, of uh, Republicans wanting to move on from him, but they don't quite know how to do that without alienating his base of support, which they still need. And they really need to kind of thread this needle between Trump supporters uh, and voters that he brought into the party and also those suburban voters that have left the party over the past couple of years under Donald Trump. That is kind of the, the key here. Um, and so that's a big question facing these lawmakers. Another thing that I heard over and over again from lawmakers up here, Scott, was that Republicans need to wake up to the idea that they need to get their voters to turn out early and to vote by mail and need to kind of capitalize on those kinds of resources. This, of course, uh, after years of Donald Trump demagoguing vote by mail and early voting, Republicans are saying, you know, that essentially has cost them in some of these races. It's been a difficult 24 hours for the former president in particular, Trump.org is convicted by a jury in New York on 17 counts. The runoff goes the wrong way for him in Georgia. Now, I get this sense that there's a fatigue, a unique and growing fatigue setting in with senators of having to answer questions about Donald Trump every day again. Did you get that kind of either sense or pushback yeah. today? Yeah, that's exactly right, Scott. I've been feeling this today. I felt it last week when I was up here. Republican lawmakers are are pretty exhausted by it, especially when, you know, every Monday it seems there is some kind of new controversy surrounding the former president, whether it was di dining with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes, whether it was his uh, comments over this past weekend, uh, trying to do away with parts of the Constitution, to today uh, as they're kind of grappling with the results, not only in Georgia, but the midterm term landscape more broadly and trying to, you know, move on from this and, and win elections. They now have several data points about a weakened 
a former president. But right now, uh, he is the one, the only one that is running in 2024 as of now. And I've been having, you know, conversations with Republicans about whether they need to, you know, coalesce early around an alternative. A lot of operatives kind of make the point now that they have other options going into the next election. But it's not clear who that will be. And as you're looking at these Republicans, a lot of them are, are looking at these midterm results and saying, well, maybe I should get in and we'll see if that happens. We may have to figure out the answer to that in a matter of months, if not weeks. Caitlin Huey Burns at the U.S. Senate tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that does it for today. You can stream Red and Blue Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And a reminder, if you want to watch previous episodes of the program, you can see them anytime on the CBS News website. Just head to cbsnews.com slash red and blue. Original CBS Reports documentary. When folks on the right talk about socialism, it's a boogeyman. Socialists are always going to promise you free tuition, free health care, free everything, but they will never promise you freedom. I think of socialism as government control. 